Welcome to First Federated Church's online video podcast of this week's sermon. First Federated Church is based out of Des Moines, Iowa. Please visit www.firstfederated.org for more information. Now, I know that many of you are on Facebook. I'm just curious, how many of you go to Facebook and take a look once or twice a week? Would you raise your hand? All right, how many of you who are on Facebook are friends with Pastor David? Okay, well, David needs to be doing some recruiting and get some more friends. <laughs> but if you are a friend of Pastor David, then you would have maybe seen a post that he put out this, this week. He was reading in the 515 uh, uh, New Testament reading plan. And uh, he put out a post uh, from his reading in Colossians chapter 1. And basically what he said was this, that uh, since our, our emphasis on the kingdom of God It's been amazing to him how that as he's reading the scripture, the kingdom of God concept and theme just keeps popping up. For example, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, we find the Apostle Paul writing these words, For he, speaking of the Father, has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. That shows up right there in Paul's writing to the, to the Colossian believers about the kingdom of God. Also, it shows up again in Colossians chapter 4, verse 11, when, when Paul identifies some, some Jewish men as my co-workers who are working with me here for the kingdom of God. I don't know if it would interest you or not, but I'll share this tidbit with you that if you continue on reading through the New Testament, you're going to discover that the kingdom of God is mentioned over 150 times. So it is no small emphasis. In fact, the kingdom of God theme sort of begins with, the, uh, with John the Baptist. You'll remember John the Baptist, a cousin of the Lord Jesus, appointed by God to prepare the way for Jesus to be able to be recognized and announced as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. His preparatory message, what was it that John the Baptist was proclaiming at all times, well, Matthew 3, 2 records that his message was repent. Repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Of course, we now know because of our study over these last couple of weeks that when Jesus began to preach what his message was and is, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. After the initial training of the disciples, Jesus sent the twelve out to do ministry on their own. And he sent them with this message recorded in Matthew 10, 7, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Later on, Jesus commissioned 72 disciples to go out and do ministry. And he sent them out with this instruction. He said to them, he said, now, when you go and you minister to those who receive you, to those who are open to what you're saying, then tell them that the kingdom of God has come near to them. Luke 10, 9. To those who reject you, who don't really want what you are offering, then warn them that the kingdom of God has come near. Luke 10, 11. And so what we find, and I could keep going on and on, we find that Pastor David really does have a point, that the more we read Scripture with an awareness of the kingdom, the more it seems to pop up. Well, I'm going to invite you today, if you would, to take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. We're returning there, chapter 1, verse 15. Last week, as we looked at Mark 1, 15, we deconstructed it. We took the various parts, the phrases, and the individual words, and we defined and explained them to see uh, what their meaning was uh, individually. Now today, we are going to reconstruct uh, this passage, and the purpose of reconstructing it is to uncover what it meant to the original hearers of this message 2,000 years ago, what it still means to those who encounter the message today in 2015 um, what it means to you and I. Before we, um, before we get into that reconstruction, uh, let's take a moment just to pray. If you would, uh, I would like for you to join me in prayer, just asking the Father to uh, speak to us by his Holy Spirit. Uh, 
it means very little what I think or say. My words are um, of very little profit, but what the Word of God says and what the Spirit says to our hearts and minds is of tremendous value. And Lord, we, we, we come now and we pray that you will use this time to speak to us. Oh God, I pray that you will remove the distractions, the things that, um, that pull at us every day, the fears, the doubts, the insecurities, maybe even the, the positive things that right now we're, maybe we're on the mountaintop and we're rejoicing and having a lot of fun and that's good and thank you for those times, but may those things uh, fall away for a few moments this morning that we may hear your word and that your spirit may speak something to us that helps us to see Jesus and helps us to see our relationship with him. May you move us today to to walk in a more close way with you. Draw those who have yet to believe to a place of faith, I pray. Those who have already come to that place of belief in Jesus, may you draw them and me, us together to to see the areas where we need uh, continual change. Maybe we'd be willing to allow you to have your way in our lives. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may recall from last week that when we uh, deconstructed Mark 115, we found that it broke down into six different parts. And and there they are on the screen. And I think I put them on the note guide. I'm not sure. But basically it just breaks down with these parts. The time is fulfilled. Number one, number two, the kingdom of God. Number three is at hand. Number four, repent. Number five, believe. And number six, the gospel. And we looked at those individually last Sunday. And if you missed, or you'd like to go back and review that again, you can go online, firstfederated.org. Go uh, to the media tab, and there you will find both the audio and video files. You can also find the note-taking guides there week after week, and, and you can be reacquainted or acquainted for the first time with that teaching. But based on... The definitions and the explanations that were given of those six parts last Sunday. Today, we bring them back together and we find this comprehensive message. And I put it on your note guide in full so that you could see it. And it's on the screen. And now I'm going to share it with you. What Jesus is saying in Mark 1.15 is this. He is saying that all the prerequisites for this aspect of God's eternal plan have been taken care of. God's rule, meaning his law, his instructions, his decrees, his statutes, and his reign, speaking there of his supremeness and his sovereignty and his control, God's rule and reign is now accessible to you. Consider the realities and the outcomes of your present course of life and change your mind, turning from self-rule and reign to the rule and reign of God. Embrace with your whole being the good news that you can be set free from self-rule and reign which leads to eternal death and enter into God's rule and reign which is eternal life. Uh, That's what the deconstructed Mark 1.15 says when when we bring it back together. And perhaps some of you may be thinking, well, Pastor Mike, Jesus' original words were 18. He used 18 words. And now you've maybe muddled the water a little bit with a 93-word blowout. I actually counted my words, 93 of them. And perhaps that's true. I pray that that's not the case. But you know what? This morning I, I want to say to you that I will risk, I will risk it. Because we must understand what Jesus is saying. This morning, I'm serious. I'm really serious about this. If we miss this 18-word this statement, if we miss it by not understanding what he's really saying, we, we risk totally missing Jesus and, and all that he offers. Because everything that he offers is really encapsulated in those 18 words. And so I'm going to take another run at it. Instead of 93 words, I'm going to try to bring it a little bit briefer. The question is that we're dealing with today is what did Jesus 
What does his announcement mean to his audience 2,000 years ago? What does it mean to us today? The simplest way I know to interpret Jesus' kingdom proclamation, and this is on your note guide as well, is by using these words. Jesus is saying that access to God's authority, power, and personal presence has arrived. What good news. Surrender of your kingdom to God's is the condition for access. Trust me, this is good news for you. That's what Jesus was saying 2,000 years ago. That's what he's still saying to us today. Is that access to God's authority, his power, and his personal presence has arrived. You can access it. You can experience it. You can live in it. But surrender of your kingdom to God's is the condition for access. And while there is a condition... Nonetheless, this is good news for you. You know, I can't imagine why anybody would not want access to God. Can you? Just to be able to talk to him. Uh, Just to to know that he hears what we say and that he he responds is, 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 is really huge. And so the possibility to go beyond just talking to him, to have access to his authority and his power and, and, and access to his personal presence in our lives, why wouldn't we want that? How could that not be good news? It is. But we must understand that inherent to this access is a condition. And that condition, write it on your guide if you would please, is surrender. 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 That's what Jesus is referring to when he says in those 18 words, and he calls for repentance. He says, repent. You see, repentance is all about a change of mind that results in a change of life direction. Why does Jesus call for repentance? Why does he call us to surrender? Well, the scripture is very clear about this. It teaches us that we are all born into the kingdom of sin. We're not born into the kingdom of God. We're born into the kingdom of sin of which Satan is king. And as we mature in our lives, we begin to build our own little kingdoms. We all begin to build those little realms in which we can be king or queen, or at least in which we can act like one. And Jesus calls us to repentance because from this position of citizenship in the kingdom of sin, of which Satan is king, access to God's authority, power, and personal presence is is unreachable. It's unattainable. What do I mean by that? What I mean to say is that one cannot choose to remain in their own kingdom, ergo Satan's kingdom, and enjoy the benefits of God's kingdom. What I want to What I want us to all understand this morning is that God's kingdom is accessible. It is accessible to you. It is accessible to your neighbor. It is accessible to every single person on the face of this earth, but only to those who will renounce self-rule and surrender to the rule and reign or the loving leadership of God through Jesus. Thus, Jesus calls for repentance. Not necessarily a sorrowing of the heart, like we talked about last week, but a change of mind. In fact, really what Jesus does is he comes to us and he speaks to our soul and he says something like this. He says, my friend, look at your life. Look at your life. Have the years of self-rule and or following the governance of this world's system, has it brought you peace? Has it brought to you joy? Has it brought you contentment? Has it brought you the hope that your soul longs for? Most of us who have lived life very long 
easily say, no, it hasn't. My attempts to rule my own world seemingly always fall apart or frustrate me. And the world's advice seems to lead me more times than not into deeper trials and tribulations. And so Jesus says, well, if you discover that and you find that that's the way it is, then my invitation to you is that you turn from self-rule. That you turn from this world's ways, that you that you then embrace the loving, compassionate leadership of God through Christ Jesus. That's the Lord's invitation. Turn. Turn to me. And and, and this is what Paul is speaking about when he writes in Colossians 1.13 how the Father has rescued us From the kingdom of darkness, you see, we're born into that kingdom. And we must be transferred out of that kingdom into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus Christ. And for that transference to take place, we must lay down our self-rule. We must turn from the rule and the reign of this world and its pseudo-wisdom. And we must... We must... Surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ as our King. And I want to tell you something I know. Right about now, every demon in this place is doing everything they can to distract you. Yes, there are demons in this place. Every demon in this place is doing everything they can to bring confusion to your heart and mind. Because what we're talking about this morning is where the rubber really meets the road. Demons, demons will sleep through your average Bible study. Honestly, they don't care too terribly much if you learn about Moses and Abraham and David and Solomon. They don't get too terribly concerned if you think you've discovered the ins and outs of biblical prophecy. Those things have their importance, but those things do not change lives per se. But when we individually or corporately deal with the issue of surrender to God, When we begin to seriously contemplate giving up our kingdoms to fully embrace his, not only are lives changed, but friends, the gates of hell get pushed back and they lose ground. They lose territory. Because when a person or a church gets under the leadership of God, When they get under his authority, his power, his presence, then God becomes demonstratively active. And when he becomes demonstratively active, his kingdom moves forward and everything in its path begins to crumble and fall apart. And that's why they get excited. Because my friend, the biggest threat to the forward movement of the kingdom of God It's not a lot of the things that we focus on. It's really the little kingdoms that we keep holding on to and saying, I must rule, I must reign. And when I rule and reign, the Lord backs away and says, okay, have it your way. Because you see, my friends, God is not a bully. He's a loving, compassionate leader. He is not a totalitarian bully. God is not in the business of forcing you to do or be something that you don't want to be or do. (laughs) The truth of the matter is is that if you don't want the benefit of his loving leadership, you don't have to submit to it. God will let you go your own way. God will let you make your own choices. God will allow you to use your limited intellect and your limited power to do your own thing. He'll let you go there. But for those who have and do and then come to understand that all of their intellectual power and all of their going their own way has done nothing but dig the hole deeper 
has done nothing but cause them to have a broken mind and a broken spirit and a broken soul. There's good news. There's good news. You can walk away from your broken down kingdom. You can walk away from the the pseudo wisdom that fails over and over again of the kingdoms uh, of sin and Satan. You can find rest. You can experience restoration. You can have reconciliation. You can experience true power and authority and purpose and contentment and joy and love and acceptance and family and community. You can experience all of these things and you can have them in the loving leadership of God as a citizen of his kingdom. And all of that sounds really good, doesn't it? It really does. And we smile, don't we? We smile when we think of love and family and community. When we think of acceptance and joy and peace and purpose and authority and and God's personal presence. It, it, it's all good, really, for us until we, until we circle back around and stumble over, once again, the idea of surrender. Surrender is just not what we're about as human beings. We don't like the idea of surrendering control, do we? You know what we're afraid of? What if, what if I get taken advantage of? What if I let the gate down? What if I get off the throne? What if I let somebody else have control? Won't I risk being taken advantage of? What if I don't get what I want? What if the one that I give control over to doesn't value what I value and, and doesn't see life the way I see it? I, Won't I risk not getting the things that I want, that I perceive will will make me happy? What what if I'm asked to give up something that is very valuable to me? What if I'm asked to do something I'd really rather not do? What if? What if? What if? What if? The what ifs are endless. They really are. And I don't have an answer for all the what ifs that, that we can drum up. But I do have an answer for two what ifs. What if we decide to stay in the kingdom of self rule? What if we say, I just can't afford to give it up? Be you Christian or not? What if I decide to stay in the kingdom of self rule? Well, here's what I can tell you. You'll never come out for the better. And the reason you won't come out for the better is because you simply do not, neither do I, have the power, the intellect, the wisdom, or the ability to control the future. (laughs) We can't even control ourselves. We can't even control our present. And if we choose in that context to stay on the throne of self-will, then we will grow old and we will grow bitter And we will grow tired of fighting both an internal and an external war that we cannot win. And we will die without hope and without God and without the possibility of ever reversing those decisions. That's what happens when we choose to stay in the kingdom of self-will. But what if we decide to repent? What if we choose to change our mind, and thus our life direction changes. We, we decide to, to renounce the kingdom of this world and to, to lay down self-rule for the loving, compassionate rule of God in Jesus. Well, if we choose to do that, my friends, then we will, we will have access to God's authority, to his power, to his presence. There will be battles that we will still have to fight. There will be things that we will be called to give up. There will be things that we will be called to take on. 
Life's challenges will not disappear, but you will have the authority, the power, and the personal presence of God to guide you and assist you in dealing with all of those issues in a successful way. You will still grow old, but not bitter. And when your time comes to die, you will die with hope. You will die with God. You will die to this world with eternal life, and you will die to this realm and come alive in a new realm in which you will have a glorious future that includes ruling and reigning with Christ forever. 2,000 years ago, Jesus opened his mouth and he made the proclamation of the ages. He said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. We've been focusing on that now for a couple of weeks. Do you know what Jesus did immediately after that? Immediately after making that pronouncement, do you know what he did? Well, just look with me at Mark 1, 16 and following. And as he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What did they do? With that invitation. Verse 18 says they immediately left their nets. And they followed him. Here's what I want you to take away today. Walk away from this service today. This time today in the word. With this ringing in your ears. That the call of the kingdom of God. And of Jesus. The king of God's kingdom. Is follow me. That's his call. Follow me. Follow me by its very nature requires that we stop following one thing in favor of another. And that's what repentance is all about. Let me share with you something. I wasn't sure if I was going to or not today, whether I was going to do it today or wait, but it seems as though The prompting in my soul is to go ahead and do it now. As I've been studying this deal in the kingdom of God, I want to to say something to you. I want to give you a little sentence. You might even choose to write it down. I want to warn you, though, that when I say it, for some of you, it's it's going to cause you some pain and grief. That's not what I want it to do, but that's what it will do because it will come up against everything you hold dear. Some of you will likely think, I have fallen off the deep end. I've gone crazy. I've gone nuts. I'm abandoning sound doctrine. Some of you will think, I have become a heretic. But I assure you, I haven't. I'm just following the word of God. But I want to put something in perspective for you. What we're talking about here in this series that's not going to finish next week, though the opening parts of it will, and we'll move on into other aspects of the kingdom, is really all about helping us to come to grips with what it is that Jesus offers. What is Jesus offering to you, to me? What is he offering to the world? What has he been offering from the time he began his ministry up until this very moment. Well, can I tell you that somewhere along the line, the church began to believe that what Jesus was offering was first and foremost and primary forgiveness. Forgiveness. That Jesus is standing... And let's assume that this case is forgiveness. And what he's offering is he's offering you forgiveness. And this is what he wants you to take, is forgiveness. 
that this is what he went to the cross for. This is what he died for. This is what he rose from the dead for. And all he wants is for you to take forgiveness so that you can spend eternity in heaven with him. And this is what we've taught. And this is what we've gone to the world with. And we've said that this is what he wants, is to give you forgiveness. But see, if that's the case, then the person who takes the forgiveness has just taken everything. And now they can just sit down and they can just wait for the future. There's no real need for anything else because I've just taken the fullness of what Christ is offering, right? So I don't really need to change. I don't need to transform. I really don't have to worry about laying down my own kingdom because that's not what I've been asked to do. I've not been asked to get off the throne. I've just been asked to confess that I'm a sinner and to believe that Jesus is the Savior and that he gave his life to pay my sin debt. And if I'll just acknowledge that, then it's all good. And so I can just take that nice gift and I can just live. It's nice if I change. It's nice if I grow. It would be preferable if I were to mature spiritually, but that's not necessary. And friends, that is why we have a church today in which people don't move, they don't change, they just stay, they just they just come and they get their religious goods and services and then if they don't like them, they write letters about it and they, but they don't change and they don't evangelize the world and they don't reach out to their neighbor because you see, I got my individualized forgiveness. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus did not come to offer forgiveness. That's right, that's what I said. He did not come to offer you forgiveness as the primary focus. No. He came to offer you his kingdom. Forgiveness is part of his kingdom. Heaven is part of his kingdom. But the primary thing Jesus is offering is his kingdom. And for you to take his kingdom, you know what you have to do? You have to lay down yours. He's not saying, I want to give you forgiveness now. You keep living life the way you see fit. He's saying, friend, the life you have been living is going to take you to one place and one place only. And that's a world of heartache and pain and eternity separated from the Father. So I'm, I'm, I've come. I've given my life. I've paid your debt. I'm inviting you to take my gift of the kingdom. Come under my loving, compassionate rule. Stop trying to run your own show. Stop trying to, to do your own thing. And let me guide you. I know where you need to go. I know how you need to think. I know how you need to change. And when you come under my authority, when you come under my, my loving, compassionate leadership, I'll forgive you of your sins. I'll, I'll give you eternity with the Father. But what he's offering is his kingdom. And this morning, I wonder how many of us have received that offer by faith. Have come repenting and believing in the good news. The good news that our Lord Jesus Christ has brought the presence, the power, and the authority of God into our world. And invited us to come under him. And to allow him to live through us. I sense that there may be people here today. And um, that 
you've never understood that you could come into the loving presence of the Lord. You've never understood that he invites you to come and to experience his leadership and his, his power to transform you and change you and to make you into the man and woman that God wants you to be. You can receive that today. If you're willing to turn from your self-rule, turn from this world, and by faith turn to Jesus, he will receive you with open arms. He'll forgive your sins, yes. He'll make you a son or daughter of God, yes. And he'll begin to lead you into the path of his righteousness and his goodness and his love. And I wonder if there's anybody here today who would like to move into that realm. Or if there's those who have trusted in Christ, but somewhere along the line you've picked up your kingdom again and you've started ruling. and You've been trying to have it your way instead of allowing the Lord to guide you and lead you and you've been struggling under that. I just wonder if there are those who today who might like to sort of draw a line in the sand and say today, today whether it's for the first time or whether it's for the thousandth time, I'm going to lay down my kingdom and I'm going to come under by faith the loving leadership of God in Jesus Christ. I want to give you an opportunity, if you might, to leave your seat and to come and stand with me here. And by that, just to say, Lord, here I am. I stand before you this morning acknowledging your call to repent, to turn, to trust you, to believe you with the issues of my life. Just like those first disciples I want to follow. I don't have any music. No one's going to sing just as I am. You could hum it if you'd like. But let's take a few moments. Would you like to come and just signify that today? If you would, why don't you come up here with me and let's pray together. And let's just make that commitment of ourselves. Whether for the first time, whether for the thousandth time, the ten thousandth time. Lord, my coming is to acknowledge your leadership and your rule, and I submit to it. I'm just going to invite you to bow your heads for a few moments, and in a moment I'm going to pray. Those of you who would like to come and make that commitment, you come.
Oh, God and Father, Lord Jesus Christ, King of all creation, we stand before you this morning. We acknowledge that you alone have the right to rule. You alone have the right to lead. Your love for us, your compassion, your gentleness, your goodness, your sacrifice, your resurrection. Lord, all of these point to the reasons why we should turn from our own self way, why we should turn from the ways of this world, and why we should surrender willingly, intentionally, unto you. Oh God, we receive your leadership. We receive your kingship. We renounce sin and self. We trust, Lord Jesus, in the payment that you have made, the atonement that you bring through the cross, and in the power that is yours through the resurrection of the dead. We believe and we know that you are seated in a place of honor and authority. You have the right to lead us and guide us. You have the wisdom to know what we should remove from our lives, the things that we should bring to our lives. You alone possess the understanding that can take us where we need to go to become the men and women that we need to be. And so this morning we submit to you. We turn from our willful ways and we seek to follow you. Now, Lord, just like those, those first disciples, we know that this is going to be an ongoing process. Repentance is not a one-time thing. It's a, it's a daily act of life. You'll bring us to new challenges and new forks in the road and new issues we hadn't been aware of. And at each point, you're asking of us that we surrender and follow you. And our purpose today in standing here is to declare that this is what we want to do. So I pray that in each heart that is here, that is desiring this, whether they are standing here with me or at their seat or aren't standing at all, but in their heart this is what they desire. Holy Spirit, we trust in you to move upon us and to work, to continually change us, to make us new each day, calls us to see your truth and your wisdom as we are in your word, as we fellowship with one another and challenge one another and encourage one another and pray for one another, that we may follow you and walk in your steps. Lord God, I, I submit First Federated Church to you in its entirety. We are yours. Lord, help us to repent of any, any self-rule that we may Try to exercise and be fully willing to follow you wherever you take us. Do whatever you ask of us. You are our king and our master. You are our savior and our Lord. And so we commit ourselves to you this day. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And those who agree with that prayer say, Amen. 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 God bless you. Um... So, thank you for coming today. Thank you for listening. I pray that you will take uh, the things that we've shared and that they'll make a, an impact in your life. If you're a first-time guest, I'd love to meet you. I'm going to try to make my way back there. If you need someone to pray with you, I'm available. There's others here that are available. Steve, would you come down and you're prepared to pray with anybody who may need to talk and pray? And uh, God bless. Thanks for coming today. Thank you.